This is one of those topics that no matter how objective you try to approach it, if you talk about it, someone will undoubtedly get mad at you. But I'm going to say what I'm going to say here, and I apologize in advance if it upsets you. The reaction to the first episode of Season 2 for House of the Dragon has had a bit of a divided response. If you never read the book, Fire and Blood, this issue may not bother you at all. If you have read Fire and Blood, I think the portrayal of the blood and cheese scenario has caused some disagreement among readers, but it really just puts a magnifying glass on a bigger topic at hand, and that is the topic of adaptation. Now, our author, George R. Martin, already makes this a challenging task in his main series, A Song of Ice and Fire, with various point of view characters having perspectives and judgments based on myths and legends, hearsay, and gossip. This is an area of writing George really likes to play around with, offering perceptions as facts only to have something contradict this perception later in his book from a different character. The fact Game of Thrones was as good as it was in their earlier seasons is actually very impressive regardless of our opinions of Dan Benioff and D.B. Weiss for the later seasons. But Fire and Blood took this idea of unreliable narrators and unreliable witnesses and cranks it up to about a thousand. But compared to A Song of Ice and Fire, where Fire and Blood amplifies the idea of various unreliable accounts of events, it dials back actual narrative, character development, and detail to the point that if you read a chapter from any of the five books in the main series and then read Fire and Blood, you'd quickly recognize how little any of these events are developed beyond a general plot and outline. Gone are the intimate inner thoughts of characters and nuance. The themes are more generalized. Each event is described in such a surface level and events are more checked off like a to-do list than they are dwelt upon and truly explored. Blood and Cheese, however, even in the context of Fire and Blood, really jumped out at those that read the book. And there's a couple reasons for this, but other than some minor dialogue in the book version, from the time Blood and Cheese encounter Helena up until the point that they leave after murdering Jaehaerys, the actual text is only a total of two paragraphs, with an extended sentence that speculates why Helena named Maelor instead of Jaehaerys. So I'm sitting here while I'm creating this video with my copy of Fire and Blood open to this page where Blood and Cheese takes place, and it's become quite clear after reading the entire chapter of The Dying of the Dragons, A Son for a Son, over and over, that we as readers have allowed our imagination to develop this scene far beyond what's actually in the text, while ignoring the primary aspect of this entire history book being unreliable. For one, we need to ask what does this scene truly accomplish in the book? It is certainly a plot point that forces both sides to have a serious revenge motive. It shows readers that both sides have people capable of very heinous acts. And book fans may argue that it's vague that Daemon ordered this, but it's actually not vague at all in the book or show. In the book, Daemon writes Rhaenyra from Harrenhal claiming revenge, specifically using the term an eye for an eye, a son for a son. And in the show, Blood and Cheese State, he said a son for a son. There's no ambiguity in either version. Again, the event is two paragraphs in the books, but as readers, we haven't enhanced this moment. And the animated version of this event also helped us along in doing this. And also, we cannot forget the unreliable narrator aspect here. This story is from the account of the court fool Mushroom. We get Mushroom's version of what happened at Storm's End between Amon and Lucerus. We are also led to believe that Mushroom is on Dragonstone when Rhaenyra gets word of Lucerus' death, and yet somehow he offers witness testimony of the Blood and Cheese event. This is the same person who claims earlier in the story that he participated in Rhaenyra's sexual development to better please Kristen Cole, and later in the book claims to have been Rhaenyra's primary advisor. Needless to say, much of this witness testimony should be scrutinized if not entirely dismissed. But regardless of the narrator, there's no denying that the events that are documented and it is agreed that someone infiltrated the Red Keep and murdered Jaehaerys in front of Helena. Now it's described in the book that Helena's guards were present and Blood simply slew these guards, but there's zero detail of any struggle. 
these wouldn't be just any guards. They would be guarded by men of the king's guard. The queen and the princes and princess are visiting the dowager queen and queen mother. Yet there's no mention of a king's guard dying at this time in Fire and Blood. And I'm pointing this out because many have called out that in House of the Dragon, Helena and her children were not guarded. But this point lasts only as long as it takes Helena to find Kristen Cole, Lord Commander of the King's Guard, in bed with Alicent. The man in charge of securing the royal family has neglected his duty, and for those that he commands, we can only speculate. But I don't think this is any more questionable than the version of Blood simply just murdering multiple guards with zero resistance. And now, you might think I'm trying to tear apart George R. R. Martin's writing here to defend House of the Dragon, but I'm not. I'm simply pointing out the context of which Blood and Cheese is written in Fire and Blood. But even with that context, Blood and Cheese really does jump out at the readers. But the same is true for the context of Blood and Cheese and House of the Dragon for those only experienced this story in the visual TV medium. What really makes Blood and Cheese so impactful in the book has very little to do with how well it is written, and much more to do with how surreal and horrific the situation is as a premise. Helena is a non-character in the book before Blood and Cheese, and there's very little to her character after Blood and Cheese. Her only line of dialogue is, who are you? And it says she pleaded with them and screamed when they beheaded Jaehaerys. All of the character development is from the reader's imagination, but within the text, it's so thin you could forget that this is even a character written by George R. R. Martin. I've heard people complain about the lack of the Sophie's Choice aspect, and while this is a point in the book that is barely even touched on in the show because Helena immediately gives up Jaehaerys, this isn't a concept that's explored in any detail in the book. Again, the reader's imagination fills many of these gaps for a book like this. Helena is described as sinking deeper and deeper into madness, and it's a dark thing for any mother to experience, and if you sprinkle on the guilt factor, you're comparing horrible to even more horrible. It's bad versus terrible, and that's not totally nothing, but the book doesn't do anything with this idea anyway, and by the next time we read about Helena later in the book, she's as messed up as you'd imagine any woman would be. But that's the point, she's not a character in the book, so she's assigned to general and predictable characterizations as are many characters in Fire and Blood. And I'm going to go ahead and say something. The reason for the lack of nuanced, really detailed story and developed characters involved in these plots, it's because that's not the purpose of Fire and Blood. It is a world building book that has a biased retelling of the history of the Targaryen dynasty. But I'd even take it a step further and actually just call it Old Town's propaganda book. But when you start comparing adapting Fire and Blood and adapting the main series of Song of Ice and Fire, you're missing the point of Fire and Blood, and I think our fandom for George R. R. Martin and our experience with how Game of Thrones was depicted after Season 4 has really jaded book readers' experience with adaptations, specifically with adaptations for George R. R. Martin's work. We want House of the Dragon to live up to the quality of the early seasons of Game of Thrones while avoiding the second half of Game of Thrones and adapt source material faithfully while the source material insists that it is not a faithful or accurate version of the events it's describing itself. Now, you can say that the book version is more impactful, and a big part of that is that you didn't get to experience how impactful this scene truly was for those that have never read the book. They didn't know it was coming, and maybe you could argue that's a cop-out, and maybe it is. But this scene needs to work for the show, not the book, and maybe the book version one for one would work in the show. But unless the show version creates a trajectory for the Dance of the Dragons that ultimately leads to a terrible ending, you're really only complaining about a horrific moment versus a very horrific moment. I get that a lot of you were expecting a Red Wedding moment for this show, but my pushback to that is that this isn't the Red Wedding moment in the book either. It's not a betrayal and a low cunning scheme that was foreshadowed and executed perfectly. With Catelyn's point of view watching the betrayal of Rob unfold before our eyes after we just spent the better part of three epic novels with these characters. The only thing that's comparable is that the premise is very dark and sadistic. But Blood and Cheese isn't given any emotional depth as far as build up. It is all premise. And when it comes to executing a premise that is truly just a plot point, House of the Dragon accomplished exactly what it needed to do for the plot in that TV show, and actually put a character, Helena, into a situation 
we've been watching experienced dreams or premonitions for the last few episodes and she reacted in that moment in a way that you definitely can't say that you totally understand or that you know exactly how another mother would react in that situation because she's not like another mother she's a different independent character of whatever our imagination was from fire and blood because she's not really described in fire and blood this character already has this unique spin that modern people can only categorize as autism, who demonstrated perfectly the experience of fight, flight, or freeze, plus the addition of whatever these visions are doing to her. I wanted a scream or some sort of a pop in that moment because I wanted my expectations met, because I had my own headcanon. It sounds like a lot of you do too, but if the book this show is adapting tells you over and over that it's not canon and you can't trust these events, what makes you think our own headcanon is any more reliable? A better question is how can you be a book purist about a book that is intentionally the antithesis of story purity? Now look, if you want my full review on the episode, you can check that out right here.